Would you like to accelerate your career and reach your full potential in just minutes a day? Welcome to the LeadX Show with New York Times bestselling author and Inc. 500 entrepreneur, Kevin Cruz. Can caring be a competitive advantage? Hello everyone, Kevin Cruz here, and in just a minute, we're going to talk about the quiet power that elevates people and organizations. But first, if you want to read great, actionable articles from the world's top leadership gurus and executive coaches, just visit leadx.org. Our guest today is the founder and CEO of Enliven Work, an organization that teaches businesses how to tap into courageous thinking, compassionate leadership, and curiosity to bring their best work to life. She's also a research scientist at Stanford University's Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education, and her new book is Awakening Compassion at Work, The Quiet Power That Elevates People and Organizations. Our guest is Monica Warline. Monica, welcome to the show. It's a joy to be here, Kevin. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. We're excited to have you on. And we're going to talk about awakening compassion at work in just a minute. But first, will you share with us a time when you actually failed, maybe early in your career, and what were some lessons you learned from it? I'd be glad to. <laughs> I um, I started off uh immediately after college working in Silicon Valley startup companies. And as I did that, I got really fascinated by what made one organization a great place to work and what made it grow fast with lots of positive energy. And then what made another organization just a drudgery of a place to work and ultimately people would leave by droves and the startup would fail and after multiple startup experiences I was so fascinated by this question that I decided to go to graduate school and study it and I immersed myself in my courses and I was so proud of myself I was relearning statistics and <laughs> you know developing all of this uh, organizational psychology technical language. And I wrote my first paper as a graduate student. And I felt uh, so happy that I had like mastered this piece of the field. And I turned it into a professor who I really admired and whose work I cared about a lot thinking that, you know, he was going to think, this is so great. She's made this transition from Silicon Valley to graduate school so well. And she's really taking on this voice of the academic scholar. And I got the paper back from that professor. I eagerly pulled it out of my student mailbox. And the cover said, Monica, this paper is passive, stilted, and jargon laden. Oh, no. And I hope that you will find a way to not write like this in the future. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> well, talk about some tough feedback. Yeah. So I spent uh, some time feeling really upset about that feedback and um, sitting with it. And then I scheduled an appointment and I went to this professor's office and I sat down and I said, I value your work and I value your feedback and I'd really like you to tell me more about what you mean by this so that I can get better because I thought I was doing what I was supposed to do. I thought I was writing the way academics write. And he explained to me that one of the things he had loved about my joining the program and my application materials was that I didn't write like an wow. academic. And he said, you know, you can't lose your authentic voice and your uniqueness because you're taking on this set of technical expertise. He said, you know, oftentimes academic writers know a lot about the technical side of their subject, but they don't actually know how to write beautiful prose and they don't actually awaken passion for the subject in the way that they write about it. And he said, I think you have a unique opportunity to do that in a way that other people don't because I had been interested in writing and I had actually been a literature major in mm. college and, and interested in 
you know, creative writing and so on. So it was a very big failure on my first paper in graduate school that taught me a really important lesson about staying in touch with my authenticity and my uniqueness and not losing that in the midst of a lot of technical expertise. Wow, that's a great story. And um, Monica, I thought we were alike in a lot of ways, but one big difference is you actually went to the professor after you got your paper to get more <laughs> feedback. I would have dropped out of the program, moved to Tijuana and opened a bar. So we're very different in the way we respond to uh, harsh criticism. <laughs> Somehow I doubt that, Kevin. But. <laughs> okay, your new book, this is great, Awakening Compassion at Work. And Lead X Nation listeners, I got to tell you why I'm so excited about this conversation and this book. And some of you out there might be thinking, compassion, oh, that's the soft stuff. I, I wanted practical stuff today. Listen up, because over and over again, we are hearing about this duality in leadership. My favorite Marine Corps general once said, Kevin, leadership comes down to competence and caring. You got to be competent in the core. You got to care for your, for your, uh, for your men. Uh, the great Doug Conan, I'm a big fan of. He talks about being tough on standards, but tender hearted on people. Uh, we just interviewed Kim Scott with her great book, Radical Candor. And she says it's two dimensions. You have to challenge directly, but care personally. And so, Monica here has gone deep into the caring, into the compassion. All these others that we keep hearing about, the, the compassionate side of leadership, no one's really, <laughs> it just occurred to me, explained, what does that mean? Like, let's, let's dive deeper into that element since that's at least 50%, if not more, of the equation. So, Monica, let's start at the beginning. You know, why do you think compassion is good for business? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head with what um, people are saying about the dimensions of leaders. And what we did in this book is go into the data across many fields and look at why compassion actually matters for organizations as a whole. And what we found is that there's really solid evidence now that more compassion in the workplace in the wake of failures, like we were just talking about is actually what helps people recover and innovate faster. There's solid evidence that supports the link between more compassion at work and the ability to give higher level service quality across a number of industries. There's very good evidence that when people feel more compassion from their colleagues and their managers in the workplace, they're willing to collaborate better and their collaborations are more successful for their customers. And there's really solid evidence that people are more willing to be adaptable to change when they feel like they have more compassion in their work environment. Wow, those are great benefits, great drivers, you know, compassion driving these these elements that, of course, are part of the chain that leads to, you know, productivity and, and service and higher sales and profits eventually. So I, as I often say, it's the soft stuff that does lead to hard results. And so you say there are four parts of compassion. What are they? Yeah, so compassion is often misunderstood as some sort of soft, fuzzy feeling. But in fact, it's a pretty complex human experience. The first part is to pay attention and notice when other people are in distress or suffering. And that link to suffering is actually what sets compassion apart from other positive experiences like gratitude or happiness. The second part is that when you notice someone is in distress, you have to interpret that as relevant to your life at work and worthy of your action. And that interpretation in turn is what drives the feeling of empathy or what academic researchers call empathic concern. Basically, you feel concerned for the other person's well-being. And once you feel that concern for another person's well-being, you are instantaneously motivated to want to act on their behalf. Wow. I'm just taking notes as we're going through this. And this is interesting. So I, I actually always thought of empathy as able to feel what you're feeling, but you're saying it's actually, uh, it's being able to feel what you're feeling and caring and giving a darn about it. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, right now, it's a very exciting time if you're interested in the world of empathy, because there's a ton of research going on in psychology around empathy. And the latest work 
suggests that when we as everyday human beings use the word empathy, we're actually referring to eight different psychological states. Wow. That can be differentiated if we're careful about our concepts. And so one of the meanings of empathy is to um, tune into your own feelings and then also be able to feel what someone else feels, right? So that's the form of empathy that's feeling together with another person. There's a cognitive form of empathy that we tend to call perspective taking, where that's what you and I would say when we put ourselves in another person's shoes. Right. That's a different form of empathy. And then this form that I'm talking about is you know, maybe I am a manager and I have an employee who is really struggling to make their client deadlines and I don't actually feel what they feel. Mm -hmm. I feel even a little bit annoyed that I have to deal with this situation maybe. But what I can do is tune into my concern for my employee's well-being and I can ask some questions and understand like, What's driving this inability to meet these deadlines? Is there something going on in your life or in the workplace that needs attention so that we can fix that? And out of my concern for your well-being, can I help alleviate a con that concern so that you can perform in a different way on the job? That makes sense. And you know that's one specific example, but can you broaden it? So when it comes to compassion for the individual manager, and that's our primary audience at LeadX or our frontline leaders, you know, how can he or she like behaviorally or, or, or implement a more compassionate approach at work? Yeah, absolutely. So the number one thing in our research that people ask for and wish they had more of when they talk about compassion at work is flexibility. And what they mean by flexibility is a little bit of flexible time and a little bit of task flexibility. So this is something that managers can often do pretty easily, and they may not even think of it as compassion. Um, in one organization that we studied, um, it made a huge difference to single parents if they could arrive at work within a half an hour window instead of having to clock in exactly on the hour and not be penalized. And they could, you know, they could stay a half an hour later and work the full schedule, but they just having that half an hour of flexibility to accommodate the late school bus or the sick kid or the late babysitter or whatever it was made a huge difference in the lives of those employees. And it was not a costly decision on the part of the manager. So first thing is, yeah, flexibility. Yeah, Monica, th that's great. I'm glad you used that specific example because uh, it, it is something that's relatively easy and doesn't cost anything, you know, to to implement. And I think I'm trying to remember the source. It might have just been the recent Gallup State of America workplace or something that said, especially among millennials, like flexibility is highly valued, like above salary, above, you know, benefits, other kinds of benefits that that flexibility is really at the top of the list. Yeah, absolutely. I think we kind of underestimate how much suffering can get created by rigid rules in the workplace. And sometimes there's a very good reason for a rule to be really rigid. But oftentimes it's simply because nobody has thought about the impact that rule or that policy is having. And they're not paying attention to the difficulty or the pain that it's creating in the lives of employees. So I think this is an implication for our leaders that we talk about when we talk about making your organization more systemically compassionate is to look at your policies or your work routines and ask yourself and your other leaders and HR managers, like, is this routine actually activating compassion? And if it isn't, could we change it in a small way that would do that? So, you know, you can hire with empathy and compassion in mind. Um, you can redesign the way you do a shift change so that people have more time to actually connect as human beings, as well as exchange whatever technical information they have to exchange. Um, you can change your clock in and clock out system, like I said. Lots of small changes on that level can actually really, really change the level of compassion in an organization.
Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned the systemic side, the organization approach, because that that was actually going to be my next question. What can managers do and then what organizationally can we do? And and you've addressed that really well. But what about the skeptics that are going to hear hear what you just said and say, <laughs> yeah, but OK, I'm going to start giving people more flexibility and now they're going to take advantage of me. You know, you give them an inch and they take a mile. So what would you say to that? Well, I would say that is the A, number one fear of managers that I talk to all the time. And in fact, the research bears that out. Um, Some researchers have looked at the top fears of compassion or what are the things that stop us from being more compassionate in our lives generally and then in our lives at work. And that number one fear is that if I'm compassionate towards someone, they'll take advantage of me. So I would say to that skeptical manager that, first of all, because you're holding on to that fear and that fear is very broadly held in our culture, it may be disproportionately real to you that that's what's going to happen. But if you try out giving a little flexibility, you may find that, in fact, people are so grateful for the flexibility that they work harder, they become more committed, and they become more engaged. So that's our research shows that when managers act with compassion, they actually get extraordinary human results. They don't get worse results. Yeah. And that, that's been, you know, I mean, my personal experience uh, in business, but also the research as well. It's sort of like when you put up the walls, when you keep a distance, you know, from, from your team members, that's when they're more likely. I mean, it's, I, I'm not just saying it, it's the research. If you're in retail, they're more likely to be stealing from you. Uh, if you're in a, a big corporate environment, they're going to do what you tell them to do, but they're not going to give you their ideas, their discretionary effort. But as soon as you start to care, as soon as you start to engage them, they do better for you. They're less likely to do any of those things that you're actually fearing. So I'm glad you see it the same way. And this is getting a little bit organizational development geeky on you, Monica, but do you have instruments like survey instruments to measure compassion at work? Like how would you actually measure whether Kevin is being compassionate or whether Kevin's company has a high compassion quotient or something like that? Well, I love to go to the OD geeky space (laughs) with you, Kevin. (laughs) There are several self-report scales of compassion at the individual level that you can use if you run like an employee survey and you want to include an empathy or a compassion measure. There are several validated measures out there that would tell you about a baseline of how compassionate your employees feel that they are. Um, We also are working with scholars um, based in Australia who are developing right now a survey-based measure of how compassionate is an entire organization. So that's a relatively new measure, but it, it does exist and it's getting tested. That's sort of new research as we speak. And then the third thing we've done is we've developed a quiz or more of a kind of a self-assessment tool about how compassionate is your organization. And we published that self-assessment quiz together with the Greater Good Science Center at Berkeley. So if you visit the Greater Good Science Center and you look in the self-assessment quiz section, you can find one about compassion at work. And that is not scientifically validated evidence, but it will give you, based upon our research parameters, a good sense of how much compassion is in your organization. Wow, that's fantastic. That's great. And as a follow up, I mean, with the research, and I know this is emerging, but with the research that that you and others are doing now, are you seeing any like demographic uh, uh, correlations, you know, to compassion at work? Are men or women more likely to be compassionate? Are certain ages or, or anything like that more compassionate? Well, that's such an interesting question. Uh, we are not finding systemic demographic differences in the behavioral expressions of compassion when we look for, you know, do you help others at work? Do you offer um, social support? Do you offer emotional support? These these kinds of things that (laughs) we geeky academics try to measure. (laughs) But what we do find is that there's a huge gender difference in who resonates with the word compassion. 
So what I know, and you know, somewhat unfortunately, is that just by having compassion in the title of the book, it's going to appeal far more to your female readers mm. than to your male readers, because culturally, compassion is seen as a part of the female nurturing domain, right? And it isn't interpreted to be as relevant to the male domain of, you know, conquering the world and being the provider. And that's a part of why I think there's a gender bias or a gender difference around the word itself. But when we dig down a little bit deeper and we try to measure, well, who is doing stuff that if we just looked at it, we would say that's compassion. We don't see as much of a difference. Yeah, that is interesting. So, you know, you are seeing sort of the the expected or stereotypical gender role or, or differences when it comes to compassion and uh, in, in terms of where, you know, who it resonates with. Hey, Monica, I think, though, that this book, so this is good. So Awakening Compassion at Work, okay, it might appeal to women a little bit more than men. You just need to write a follow-up and make it like, the power of compassion. It's raw and in your face and like use all these big <laughs> macho words in the title. And then you'll just cover the whole second half and you'll have the whole, the whole market covered. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, that's why it's so important that we have people like you, Kevin, talking about the need for compassion and care in workplaces. Because in fact, the more that we have leaders who are willing to use the word compassion and who are willing to stand up for the value of care in organizations, the more that we can, you know, break down the stereotypical understanding of the word. And I think what you touched on in your introduction is so powerful that, in fact, when people have studied different organizations, the military is one of the most compassionate organizations that people describe. Because you have that ethos that you have to be tough and you have to be caring. And those bonds that people build with others in the military when they know that they're under fire and they have to perform and they have to take care of each other in order to do that. I mean, that's the kind of message that we're talking about when we talk about compassion. So if we have to find a whole bunch of different words to describe it in ways that people will recognize, um, that's the mission that we're on to do that. Yeah, I, and, and we didn't plan to to go uh, down this rabbit hole, but you know, I often will close my my public talks with stories about my interactions with the United States Marine Corps and not to tell the whole story. But, you know, when I went and spent a, a day with General Bailey and some of his officers uh, and I was going to give a speech about engagement, I was terrified because I've never served in the military. I, my father was a Marine. His stories to me when I was a little kid scared the heck out of me. So I, I never <laughs> listed. And, but And I'm in awe of them. And what am I going to teach these guys about leadership? It was an amazing experience. And Everywhere I looked, you know, they would salute General Bailey and then give big hugs, big bear hugs. And, you know, he uh, his first question when he was inspecting the troops is, did anyone get hurt, you know, on the march? You know, all about care. They were all asking about each other's families and looking after each other's families. And I had the um, very unique privilege of going down to the Pentagon when uh, General Bailey got his third star promotion ceremony. And it's every bit the... U.S. Marine Corps ceremony you would expect. And at the very end, the commandant asked General Bailey, said, um, who do you want to pin on your, your new star? And he points to the front row and he says, I want my brothers and my mama to do it. And <laughs> there was Mama Bailey in the front row and his brothers who stood up and then you couldn't even see General Bailey because they're surrounding him, you know, putting putting the stars on his shoulders. And the way the core integrates the family and it like I said, it isn't even a uh, I don't know what they call it, like if they call it compassion, but it just is who they are. It is like family. It really shows to me, I think, like. It isn't all about just being soft or nice that you're going to get rolled over. Nobody would accuse officers in the Marine Corps of being soft. And yet there's that compassion side. So I think that's awesome. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, that's such a great example. When people in business are afraid of compassion because they're afraid it's going to make them look soft or look weak, I do think we can point to leaders and examples like that and say, you know, you can't accuse those 
people of being weak. Look at what they do right. every day. Look at the results that they get in their organization. Yeah. Now, Monica, you know, I like to challenge our listeners to get a little bit better every single day. So what can you challenge us with to actually try out today? I want to challenge the LeadX listeners today to try out this saying that I remind myself of and that I was reminded of by one of the most compassionate leaders I know, which is that whenever human beings are gathered together, there's always pain in the room. And most compassion in organizations actually gets blocked because we don't notice that the suffering is there. So if we're paying more attention to other people, the state that they're in and what's going on in their lives, we're always going to be tapping into the possibility for compassion. So if we don't see it, we can't act on it. I try to remind myself as a leader in my own field and when I'm going around talking about this topic that there's always pain in the room and that means there's always the possibility for compassion. Wow, always the possibility for compassion. That's great. Uh, Monica, what's the best way our listeners can find out more about you and your work? I am putting lots of content related to Awakening Compassion at Work on awakeningcompassionatwork.com. So you can find out a lot more about me there. And we are running 100 days of Awakening Compassion right now where we're sharing bits of wisdom from the book, one piece each day for the next 100 days. And you can also connect with me on social media at Monica Warline. Perfect. Friends, you've just been mentored by Monica Warline. Don't forget, you can get all the links she just mentioned and the notes from this interview over at leadx.org. And of course, get Monica's new book, Awakening Compassion at Work, at amazon.com or your favorite bookstore. And listeners, one more thing. If you got even one new idea from the LeadX show, I hope you'll hop on over to iTunes, click subscribe, leave a short, honest review. That would mean the world to me. Until next time, remember, of course, leadership isn't about a title or power or authority. It's all about influence. We are all leaders. The question is, who are you going to lead today? <laughs>